Well, hello, my chemistry stars. Mrs. Hansen here, ready to begin our chapter eight lessons. Title of our new topic, Solutions. When I look at our topics in chapter eight called Solutions, we begin in our first section really with a reminder from chapter one. What are mixtures? I know solution is a homogeneous mixture. We also learn to classify matter in terms of element, compound, homogeneous or heterogeneous mixture. So our first topic should bring back some review from our initial chapter together. Section two, we bring out the topic called electrolytes. Electrolytes, we'll see, are charged ions in water and they conduct electricity. And so we'll focus on what that means to be a strong, weak, or non-electrolyte. In our third section, we talk about solubility. Does a salt dissolve in water? And if so, how much? How many grams of solid per milliliter of solution? Is just one example of a way we measure solubility. How does temperature and pressure affect solubility? We'll look at some uh, interesting graphs and talk about the effects of raising temperature or cooling temperature along with pressure changes in terms of solubility, solute dissolved in a solvent. What are the ways we express concentration? We'll talk about percent concentration and a unit that is favorite to chemists called molarity. We'll see that that's abbreviated capital M for molarity. We'll perform some dilution problems looking at a, a quick formula where MV equals MV. We'll learn that that means molarity times liter is molarity times liter. And we can dilute, which we know just seems to add water to the solution to decrease the concentration. We'll look at some colligative properties. That's a fun word to say, isn't it? Colligative properties, such as raising boiling points, lowering freezing points, and changing osmotic pressure are all colligative properties. We'll learn that that just simply means physical properties that change just because I've added a solute into the solvent. So for example, pure water might boil at 100 degrees Celsius. Pure water might freeze at zero degrees Celsius but a salt water solution would have a higher boiling point and a lower freezing point. And osmosis and dialysis, a very good application in the healthcare sciences of these colligative properties. So as we look at our topics, we'll keep in mind our chapter learning goals. We'd like to be able to describe the fundamental properties of a solution and determine whether that solution is going to be classified as a true homogeneous mixture a colloid or a suspension and that we'll learn is just based on particle size of the solute and does it uh, spread light called the Tyndall effect and Brownian motion. We'll classify a substance as an electrolyte or a non-electrolyte. Does it conduct a current in water? You'll predict whether a substance is soluble in water or in a nonpolar solvent. And we'll talk about that likes dissolve likes general rule. Likes dissolve likes, polar with polar, nonpolar with nonpolar, but never the two uh, together. You'll predict the temperature effect and pressure effect on solubility. We're going to look at a variety of concentration units of solutions. You'll prepare a dilute solution from a more concentrated solution and you'll be able to describe and calculate the effects on boiling point and melting points of a pure, from a pure solvent compared to a solution. And finally, you'll describe that process called osmosis and how it relates to biological membranes and dialysis. Why are we studying solutions? Well, in this chapter, homogeneous mixtures are two or more substances that are pure, that look the same throughout. You know, why are table salt and sugar soluble in water, but they're not soluble in vegetable oil or gasoline? And so we'll learn about that likes dissolve likes general solubility rule about polarity. How does a healthcare professional take a drug as supplied by the manufacturer and prepare a dilute solution to administer a proper dosage to their patients. And an understanding of just general solubility principles and concentration units are needed to explain each of these phenomena. So let's begin. The first thing we'll do is define a mixture. Mixture 
we know has multiple ingredients and they can be hetero or homogeneous in nature. Let's remember that in terms of classifying matter from our first chapter, we said matter, of course, is anything that has mass and volume. And if matter can be classified as either pure or as a mixture. Of course, this is the focus now of our topic called solutions. The mixture in this topic is going to be a homogeneous mixture with uniform composition throughout the sample. Homogeneous mixtures are commonly called solutions. Remember if we had pure matter back up here to this um, classification, we said that there was actually two different categories of pure matter, which would be the elements and the compounds. And if you were a mixture, you could be homogeneous or you could be heterogeneous, different throughout. And this slide really is just a revisiting of our first chapter when we classified matter. Matter, of course, can be classified as solid, liquid, or gas based on the phase, or it can be classified based on its composition as being pure or a mixture. And if it's a mixture, it can be homogeneous with uniform composition or heterogeneous, having a non-uniform composition throughout the sample. Solutions, which we said are homogeneous mixtures, contain small particles. A solution is made up of two parts. It's the solute and the solvent. The solute is what gets dissolved in the solvent. It's what you have the least of, and the solvent is always what you have the most of in your homogeneous solution. So a solution that contains very small particles consisting of two parts, the solute and the solvent. And you simply say, a solute dissolves in the solvent. Together, they create a solution. And just know that the vast majority of solutions in our lab and in our situation will be aqueous solutions. And of course, when you see this term aqueous, you know that that means water is the solvent. And water typically is known as the universal solvent for all kinds of, of chemistry reactions. Aqueous solutions, we know get that little adjective of AQ. So if I see, for example, NaCl with a little S next to it for solid, I want you to picture salt crystals. But if you see NaCl with a little AQ after it, now I want you to envision those salt crystals have been dissolved in water, and this is a salt water solution, a homogeneous mixture. Where this is a pure compound. Great. And we can take a look at all the solutions uh, in different phases of matter. Notice that air is a mixture. Air is considered to be a homogeneous mixture, a blend of many different gases together. The most abundant uh, type of gas in air is nitrogen. So therefore, nitrogen would be considered the solvent. We have oxygen, water, vapor, carbon dioxide, all kinds of trace gases in air as well. And they will blend uniformly simply because we know gases will diffuse and occupy whatever space they're given. And to diffuse evenly creates a homogeneous mixture called a solution. Here's an IV bag. So an IV made of a saline solution, typically about 0.9% is the homeostatic level for um, sodium chloride. Notice in a moment when we talk about sodium chloride and water, it's going to be called an electrolyte because those ions will dissociate and you'll see that they are its charged ions and not held together in fixed uh, crystalline structures any longer. The ions separate. And here's an example of a solid dissolved in a solid. This is a dental filling, often called an amalgam. Uh, if we used mercury, well, I should say liquid mercury dissolved in a solid, but you can have alloys as well where solids are dissolved in a solid, such as brass or bronze that uses um, element copper, uh, typically dissolved into zinc.
So a wide variety of mixtures in all different phases when we talk about homogeneous solutions. Now, a solution, we know that it is a, uh, a homogeneous where the, the uh, solute particle is very tiny, but we have other types of solutions as well called colloids and suspensions. Now a colloid is a homogeneous mixture, but it has larger particle size than a true solution does. So they typically will have an opaque appearance. The particles in a colloid cannot be filtered out from its other components. They do not settle out. A good example of uh, colloids includes milk, whipped cream, mayonnaise, butter, jello, all of these are examples of colloids where the solute is of a larger particle than a true solution, but it still does not settle out. So that's the key for a colloid is they have large solute particles, larger than a true solution would, but yet still do not settle Whereas in a moment when I talk about suspensions, they actually will settle out over time. So a suspension is a very large particle, the largest of all particles. So just think about a true homogeneous solution, the smallest particle. You have a colloid with larger particles but still does not settle. And you can have what's called a suspension There, a suspension, which have very large particles, so much so that over time they will separate out, they will settle. I think of uh, chalk water, uh, muddy water, flour and water, fog, even blood is considered to be a suspension because think about it, you have red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, all dissolved in this uh, liquid medium called plasma. And over time, or especially using a centrifuge, a uh, centrifuge of course is an instrument that you put a test tube in and it spins real fast. And upon that spinning, the solids will settle to the bottom and you'll have the liquid plasma sitting on top. So it can be separated either by filtering or centrifuge or just simply given enough time, the solids will fall to the bottom. So let's review solutions, colloids, and suspensions as three key terms to identify in our solutions chapter. And here's a nice example. Uh, this is pulled from your book, Table 8.1. Solutions have a very small particle size. Colloids are a little bit larger, and suspensions are largest yet. Does it settle? Well, solutions and colloids do not settle but suspensions will settle given time. Solutions cannot be separated by filtration as a colloid cannot be separated by filtration, but suspensions can be separated. The difference between solutions and colloids is simply particle size. I know that colloids can scatter light and solutions do not. If you take a flashlight and put it through a saltwater solution, the light does not scatter. If you take a flashlight and put the beam of light up to a up to jello, you can actually see the light in the actual jello. It's scattering light. Why don't we practice? Tell me what you think. Are each of these considered to be a heterogeneous mixture, a solution, or a colloid? Now when you think heterogeneous mixture, this is another word we just said for suspension because it can be separated. Suspension. I can talk and write, I swear. There we go. Chocolate chip ice cream, mayonnaise, seltzer water, nail polish remover, and brass. Let's classify these. Why don't you pause the video and put your answer down and come back when you want to check. Well, what did you write down? Shall we compare? 
chocolate chip ice cream i can see the individual chocolate chips in an ice cream mixture so i think that has separate uh, components called heterogeneous mayonnaise we learned as a colloid large particles in a um, kind of an egg based uh, whipped area i don't know how else to describe mayonnaise it's a colloid seltzer water well, this is a homogeneous solution. It has dissolved gases in the water that when you release pressure, you can see that comes bubbling out. Nail polish remover, that is an aqueous solution of acetone. It is a solution. And brass, as I said also, is a homogeneous mixture, a solution, a uniform blend of copper and zinc. How'd you do? Oh, this is fun. Just classifying matter, going back to your very first chapter. All right, well, let's begin chapter eight, section two, electrolytes and non-electrolytes. When a substance conducts electricity when dissolved in water, it is considered to be an electrolyte. Ionic solids, ionic salts built of ions are considered to be electrolytes. A substance that does not conduct an electrical current when it's dissolved in water is called a non-electrolyte. They stay as neutral molecules. So molecular compounds are considered to be non-electrolytes. Now let's just review a little bit. Remember how these are built of a non-metal plus a non-metal covalently bonded? Covalently bonded. That means they're sharing electrons. There's no such thing as ions in a covalent molecule. And therefore, since there's no charged particles, it would not be a conductor of current. For example, glucose or table sugar, blood sugar, C6H12O6. Since this is a molecular compound, all nonmetals, I don't see any charged species in here. This is going to be a non-electrolyte. Another example, hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide does not dissociate. It is not built of ions because all of these are molecular compounds, non-metal to non-metal sharing electrons. So it is a non-electrolyte. But when you consider an example such as table salt, NaCl, as a solid, we see that it's in a regular crystalline form. But when you place it into water, it dissociates, it separates, it breaks apart and forms ions. So just think about what we're saying. When NaCl as a solid is placed into water, the ions separate from one another. You get an aqueous ion of sodium plus one and an aqueous ion of chloride minus one. These are considered to be electrolytes because they're built of charges and an electrical current is really nothing more than a flow of electrons. And a flow of electrons simply come from charged ions. So to recognize electrolytes, look for ionic salts. To recognize non-electrolytes, look for molecular compounds, those guys that are built of non-metals covalently bonded. Now don't confuse this with does it dissolve because both of these dissolve readily in water. But the idea is, will it conduct a current when doing so? If it does, it must be built of ions, charged atoms. Electrolytes in terms of classification can be bro broken down into two different areas, two different categories called strong electrolytes and weak electrolytes. And then we'll talk about non-electrolytes as well. A strong electrolyte dissociates completely in water to form ions. Some examples of strong electrolytes would include sodium chloride, potassium hydroxide, hydrogen chloride, potassium bromide. Let me give you an example of what I'm seeing in terms of 
the dissociation arrow. So an example of strong electrolytes, which means they 100% dissociate. And if you don't like the word dissociate, think of it as separating, breaking apart. When sodium chloride as a solid is placed into water, we form 100% an aqueous ion of sodium and an aqueous ion of chloride. When potassium hydroxide is taken out of the bottle, it's, it's a white crystalline solid. When I take that and dissolve it into water, the ions will separate into an aqueous potassium ion and an aqueous hydroxide ion. Now remember, the polyatomic ions stay together. Polyatomic ions, we have a chart of those, don't we? They're groups of atoms acting as a unit carrying a charge. So hydroxide is one unit carrying a negative one charge. One more example, potassium bromide. As a solid coming out of the jar, this one is kind of a reddish salt. I take it and dissolve it into water. Out comes an aqueous ion of potassium and an aqueous ion of bromide. AQ. All of those 100% will dissociate. When I consider now an example of a weak electrolyte, they only partially ionize, or partially dissociate, or partially separate. Let me give you an example there. Weak electrolytes include ammonia, acetic acid, hydrofluoric acid. Let's take, for example, acetic acid, CH3, CO2H. When it's dissolved into water, we set up an equilibrium where really only about 1% of the molecule dissociates and 99% of it stays in the molecular form. A little bit of aqueous ion of hydrogen and a little bit of the acetate ion, both aqueous, ions are always aqueous, there we go. Notice that I'm setting up an equilibrium arrow to designate the weak electrolyte, that the vast majority of the equilibrium lies on the left the put together molecular form. So when we see a partial ionization, the molecule is not very good at separating, but it will just a little bit. And then a non-electrolyte, such as, oh, we had hydrogen peroxide, H2O2, it will not separate at all. So no ions form. It's not built of ions at all to have any dissociation. So here we have some examples of strong electrolytes, 100% separate into aqueous ions, weak electrolytes that just partially dissociate into aqueous ions, and the non-electrolytes that are not built of ions at all and therefore cannot separate. We've distinguished between strong, weak, and non-electrolytes and have provided examples of each. What do you think about this? Let's classify as strong, weak, or non-electrolytes. Pause the video and see what you think. Put an answer down and come back when you're ready to check. Well, let's share some strategies. In our first picture, I notice that I have some red and blue atoms in molecular form, noticing that those are non-dissociated, those are molecules. So how about if I just called that compound AB, and then I do notice that some of them are separated into A's and B's. So we have a separated 
red, and a separated blue, all in a mixture of both. Since both are present, since the molecular form, which are bonded, and the ionic form, which were separated, are both present, I classified this as a weak electrolyte. I notice in picture B, all I have is the bonded form of this compound, that I don't have any separation at all, so I call this a non-electrolyte. And in letter C, notice that they're all separated. Since they're all separated, you have only the, what I'm calling A positive and B negative, 100% of those dissociated, that must be a strong electrolyte. Did you get those? I bet you did. How about the following example? Would these solutions be electrolytes or non-electrolytes? Now, I want you to remember electrolyte, these are ionic salts. I need to find a metal positive ion hooked to a non-metal anion, right? These are cations bonded to anions based on opposite charges. Non-electrolytes are molecular compounds. They're not built of metals and non-metals. These are the non-metals all bound together in covalent bonds. So letter A, KCl. If I put KCl and dissolve it into water, out comes an aqueous ion of potassium and an aqueous ion of chloride. This is a strong electrolyte. All water-soluble salts are strong electrolytes. Well, here we have C12, H22O11. When I place this into water, there are no ions to separate. This is a non-electrolyte. It is not built of ions. So therefore, there's no separation into aqueous ions at all. It is what we call a molecular compound built of all non-metals, Therefore, there's no such thing as charges. And letter C. Well, this is potassium iodide. That is a metal and a non-metal. It's a salt. It is a water-soluble salt, so 100% of it will dissociate, which means to separate and form aqueous ions. It is a strong electrolyte. The trick is to just notice that when you have a metal to a non-metal, it's called an salt. Built of ions will conduct a current when they dissociate, which means to separate and form ions. This is a term, equivalence, that's often used in the healthcare professions. You will hear this all the time in a laboratory setting or distributing meds and so forth. An equivalent is defined as the number of moles of charge that a mole of ion contributes to a solution. The number of moles of ions in a solution. So the number of equivalents per mole of an ion equals the charge on the ion. Now that is worth highlighting. The number of equivalents per mole of an ion equals the charge on the ion. Now, sometimes we have positive charge and sometimes we have negative charge. And in solutions, there must be an electrical balance. So you have to have a balance between the total positive and the total negative charge. Just like in an ionic salt, we need one positive charge to balance one negative charge to create an electrically neutral solution. 
For example, this is the calcium ion, Ca2 positive. Because the charge is two plus, calcium ion contains two equivalents. Remember, the equivalents are equal to the charge on the ion. Whereas if I see potassium, notice it has just a plus one charge. Therefore, we see it has just one equivalent. The equivalence is equal to the charge on the ion. So if you take a look at this example, just, just a table from your book, notice that in the first, I'm given sodium ion, Na plus one. We're given calcium ion, Ca plus two. A bicarbonate ion, HCO3 minus one and a phosphate ion, PO4 minus three. When you're asked for the equivalents delivered from every mole of ion, Na plus one delivers one equivalent. Ca2 positive delivers two equivalents. The bicarbonate ion delivers one equivalents, and a phosphate ion delivers three equivalence. The equivalence is a unit that tells us the charge delivered per mole of the ion. Well, let's try one, shall we? How many equivalents of sulfate ions are present in a solution that contains 3.2 moles of sulfate ions? If you don't have these memorized yet, which you don't have to, but you do have to know where to find this information. Pull out your polyatomic ion chart. It's a test taking tool page that you've printed off and you use regularly when formula writing and it's provided for you on any quiz or test. The more that you get familiar with the chart, the less you rely on it, but I'm not forcing you to memorize, but you do have to know how to use the tool. What is the formula for a sulfate ion? Well, I want you to notice the ATE tells me it's a polyatomic ion. And when you find sulfate, you see that it's an SO4 and it carries a minus two charge. Now, if you can't find the sulfate polyatomic ion on your chart, you're gonna be in a world of hurt right here. So commit to knowing how to use your tools. This is the key piece of information. That tells me that there are two equivalents in every one mole of sulfate. The SO4 minus two tells me two equivalents are delivered from sulfate for every one mole of the sulfate polyatomic ion. And so if we have 3.2 moles of it, how many equivalents will we have? Notice what I've done is just canceled the mole unit and brought it back to the number of equivalents. 3.2 doubled, is 6.4 equivalents. And I'm just going to abbreviate that as equiv, equivalents is what you'll hear then. That's easy. The hardest part was trying to find the polyatomic ion chart, I would imagine. Why don't you pause and work these out? Come back when you would like to check your answers. Using the given number of moles, calculate the number of equivalents of each ion present. So again, the key is knowing that the charge tells you the equivalents per mole. So the information you need is provided. I didn't even need to go to my chart or periodic table. The information provided me because the charge is given in the problem. I have one mole of Na plus, and I know Based on the number of equivalents, the charge is one. So there's one equivalent in every one mole. So you would have one equivalent. Moles canceled and you have the number of equivalents. In letter B, we're given one mole of magnesium, which is two positive, which tells me that there are two equivalents in every one mole. So that would deliver two equivalents. Piece of cake, right? 0.5 moles of potassium, whoops. 
What I know from the formula is that there is one equivalent delivered for every one mole of potassium ion. Just to put the labels in there. So this would deliver 0.5 equivalents. And the last one, 0.5 moles of the phosphate polyatomic ion. Well, clearly you see that there are three equivalents delivered for every one mole of your phosphate polyatomic ion. This would give us 1.5 equivalents, which is three times 0.5. We've determined how many equivalents of each ion are present when provided the moles of each charged species. These are all examples of electrolytes. The amount of an electrolyte in blood plasma and IV solutions is often reported in the number of milliequivalents per liter of solution. That is a very familiar term, milliequivalents per liter. If I highlight that, you'll commit it to memory, correct? Milliequivalents per liter, it's most often used in the healthcare profession. Remember in a solution, there must be a balance between the total positive and the total negative charge of all the ions present. Just like when we're writing formulas, the positives must be electrically balanced by the negatives. If a solution of potassium chloride contains 40 milliequivalents of potassium ions, it also contains 40 milliequivalents per liter of chloride ions. They are balanced in electrolytic solutions. Let's try a question out with that thought in mind. If an intravenous aqueous sodium chloride solution contains 154 milliequivalents per liter of sodium ion, that's a given quantity, 154 milliequivalents per liter of sodium ions. How many milliequivalents of sodium is a patient given in 800 milliliters of solution. Well, this is really just a canceling of units as well, isn't it? I want to get rid of the liter, so I'm going to multiply by the liter, and when I do that, I can cancel the liter out, and I could just say that I can set that over one, and I've converted then to a milli equivalent. 800 milliliters. Notice this decimal, meaning that it has three sig figs. And I know that in every one liter, there is a thousand milliliters. So this is just a simple slide of the decimal, three places. Make sure that you still report three sig figs in your answer here as well. So I have 0 0.800 liters of solution. How many milli equivalents am I delivering? Well, if one liter delivers 154, 154 times 0.8, I would be delivering 123.2, and I'll remember to report three sig figs in my final answer. If 154 milliequivalents of sodium are delivered for every one liter, how many would be delivered if I had 0.8 liters? And I simply cross multiply, the liters canceled, and I would deliver 123 milliequivalents of the sodium ion in that, uh, given to that patient. Shall we try another? We have a potassium chloride solution given intravenously to a patient that has a low potassium level. It contains 40, two sig figs, that's the decimal point, milliequivalents of potassium in every one liter of solution. That's the number that I'm given right here. 
How many milliequivalents are present in 550 mils of solution? Well, to get the liters to cancel, I have to have liters that I multiply by. So we're just emphasizing that I need like units. One liter is equivalent to a thousand milliliters. So we're simply sliding the decimal place three spots to the left to convert milli into a liter. And this problem then is very similar to the previous problem. If 40 milli equivalents are delivered in every one liter, 40 times 0.55 gives me 22 milli equivalents. Notice the liters have canceled and you've converted to a milli equivalent. Here we had two sig figs, so my answer will have two sig figs. Try this one on your own, pausing the video, work it out, come back when you're ready to check. All right, well, let's see what we did. We have a solution that contains 15 milli equivalents of the sodium ion in every liter, and this also contains 10 milli equivalents of the potassium ion in every liter, and we have calcium four milli equivalents of a calcium ion in there as well. What is the total number of milli equivalents of the positive charge? Now remember, this is already taking care of the plus two. So it's already, we don't double it. There's, there's four milli equivalents of calcium ion already accounted for. So all we really need to do is to sum the total number of milli equivalents found in that solution. Right, it's all the same solution, but it's containing three different positive charge. So what is the sum? 15 plus 10 is 25, plus four more is 29 milliequivalents total in that liter of solution. The total positive is 29 milliequivalents. And if there's only one anion, it's chloride, it must balance all the positive charge. So what does that equal? Well, that's 29. So the 29 milliequivalents of chloride ion are in solution to balance the total positive charge. Remember that wherever we have a positive, we need one negative to electrically balance the charge. I like this math, it's, it's nice and easy. If a solution contains 125 milli equivalents of sodium in a liter of solution, how many milliliters of solution are contained in 25 milliequivalents of sodium? Well, this time when we cancel, we want the milliequivalents to cancel out, don't we? And we want to end with the liter. So when we think about setting this up right here, 25, and this is the variable we're solving for, isn't it? So we have to divide by 25. You can think of this really as a ratio or think of it as a proportion. If 125 milli equivalents of the sodium are delivered in every liter, 25 milli equivalents set over X liters. It's kind of the same scenario of how we'll solve Right, so when I think about solving, 125x equal 25. So what we're trying to do is pull out the volume. Divide both sides by 125. And x will come out to be 25 divided by 125.
and I get 0.2 liters. And I'm going to just erase this to make that more clear. Let's erase that and set it up as a ratio or a proportion. So set this up as a proportion and we'll see that equivalency easier. I'm going to say 25 times 1. Set equal to 125 times x. That's how we'll cross multiply. And then to solve for x, we see that we divide both sides by 125, and that's how we isolated x. And when we do so, we found our x to come out to 0 0.2 liters. Notice our question said how many milliliters? And so really, let's continue that thought because 0 0.2 liters times, and remember how we said there's a thousand milliliters in every liter? So you're really just saying 200, move the decimal three spots back to make it a milliliter. We need two decimal points, don't we? So 200 milliliters with two decimal points would be 2.0 times 10, and we would have to say squared to make it 200. Good work. Take a moment and chew on that if you need to. Go back and just tell yourself how we solved for the volume by setting up a ratio or just simply think of it as a proportion. 125 is to 1 as 25 is to x. Solving for x, we found the volume. Remember, it came out to us in a liter, and so we put it back into a milliliter for our final answer. Let's pause our lessons here, take a little break, come back for your second lesson when ready.